Amen. Ready or not, he's coming. Whether you believe it or not, he's coming. And I want you guys to understand that whether you believe the truth or whether you don't believe the truth, whether you think that you believe the truth does not change the truth. And so today as we look at Mark chapter 5, and we look at two or one of the two miracles that Mark puts in sequential order, I'll back up next Sunday and we'll deal with the one with an issue of blood. But today what I want us to understand is the progression of what's going on. See, in America, we have a gospel that is a very friendly gospel. In other words, we say stuff like this, we make Jesus our Lord. Well, let me just tell you something. You can't make it something that he already is. He's the Lord whether you know him or not. Did y'all hear what I just said? And so basically what's happened is, is Jesus in Mark chapter 4 has been preaching the kingdom of heaven. He's gone from parables to practice. In other words, his family has come. If you go back and remember, his family has come and has went through to try to save the family name. The Pharisees have said that he's lost his mind and Jesus begins to talk about the unpardonable sin and then begins to speak in a parable. And he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he says, if you don't get this parable, you don't understand anything a part of the kingdom. And so today, as we move through, as Jesus has already preached that parable, gone into practice, they got into a boat. Remember, it was evening. They went to the other side. There was a storm that rose. Jesus got them in the middle of a storm. I'm telling you, you can be following Jesus and be in the middle of a storm. Don't believe this gospel that if, if you're following Jesus that everything's gonna go your way. As a matter of fact, what you're going to find today is Jesus Christ will cause you with circumstances and situations to come into your life to make you be dependent upon him. Because by nature, you're not dependent upon anybody but yourself. Because when Adam sinned, what Adam desired was Adam wanted to be man without God. And so God says, okay, I created you to be man with God inside of you, but you want to be man without God, then go do it yourself. You're going to work and you're going to toil, and you're going to sweat, and so now you're going to have to do it on your own, and now you and I have to live by choosing what's behind door number one, door number two, door number three, and we have to live off of a conscience state, and then our conscience is really wicked because we're going to be self-centered, and we want it our way. Amen? And so what we have to be is we have to be converted in our minds to have a re renew of our thinking that we're not what we think we really are, that we need and we must be dependent upon God because he is all that there is, and if we got him, we got all we need. Amen? Are we all right this morning? Y'all good? I know y'all probably had to cut grass yesterday because it was good weather and you probably went and did a bunch of stuff, so y'all going to have to liven up. If not, we, well, I got till 4 o'clock, Okay. And so as we've walked through the gospel of Mark, we've been dealing with lordship. See, there's a lot of folks sitting in this room. You want Jesus to take you to heaven, but you don't want him to be Lord. See, what you want is you want the blessings of God, not the blesser. So here's what we do. We, we, we hear self-help sermons on the love of God. What about the God of love? See, the God of love is the God of justice. See, when you get the king, you get the kingdom. There's a lot of people that's pursuing the kingdom and they're wanting the things of the kingdom instead of the God of the kingdom. So when you get the king, you get the kingdom. You got me? So last Sunday, we looked at Jesus casting the demons into the pigs. Y'all remember? It's, it's, it's going to continue. It's, it's, that thought is going to continue, and I'm going to show it to you, okay? But here's the deal. Basically what happens is, is now the lordship of Christ, after it had been rejected, is now going to be ridiculed. It's going to be in contempt. Last week, the Lordship of Christ was confronted, or it was a, a contingency. Today, it's going to be in a contempt. People's going to look at him and go, really? <laughs> really? I'm going to show you that in just a few moments. As we walk through it from Mark chapter 1 all the way through, we've seen the Lord being the Lord of sorrow today. He's the Lord of Satan. He's the Lord of the synagogue. He's the Lord of sickness Y'all remember as we walked through this? Amen? So as we begin to dive off into this, you, I want you to understand that today the Lord is the Lord of your sorrow. Wherever your situation's got you, do you understand that you need to embrace the ministry of sorrow? Y'all not getting it. 
Let, let me explain something to you. Here, here's the deal. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he had a thorn in the flesh. And here's what he says. I would rather, I would have rather rejoice in my infirmities that the Spirit of Christ may dwell on me do y'all hear me? To make me dependent upon him, to make me understand that his grace is sufficient for me for the day, than for me to go living on my own, being independent of the things of God. So you need to understand, you need to embrace the ministry of the thorn. You need to embrace the ministry of the sorrow. Here's what, here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says that we are going to not sorrow as those who have no hope for those that have gone on before us. It's okay to be sorrowful, but we're get, we've got some hope. So we need to embrace this ministry of sorrow that Jesus is driving you to your knees. You're not fighting Satan. If you're a believer in this room and, Satan, and, and Jesus lives on the inside of you, Satan does not have no control over you. You're fighting God. I've, I've preached in little, small Southern Baptist churches that run 40 or 50 people and they ain't baptized anybody in 10 years and they go, well, Satan's among us. No, y'all fighting God. God wants folks to be saved and be baptized. Is anybody listening to me? So, put it up there. Mark chapter five gives us four characters in this one chapter for Jesus to practice and manifest his lordship. So I wanna ask you a question. Are you practicing the lordship of Christ in your life? In other words, are you dying daily are you surrendered so that the life of Christ can be lived out of you and from you and you're not li living for, for Jesus, you're living from him? G Do you understand that? Are we all right? I'm fixing to happen. In America, here's what you've been told your whole life, that you follow Jesus. If I'm following Jesus, that means he lives on the outside of me. I'm telling you, I live from him. He lives on the inside of me. For those of you, I've used it a hundred times. For those of you that have been in the military, you don't fight for freedom, you fight from freedom. You've already got the freedom and you're fighting to maintain it. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? And the Bible says the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you and you are going to surrender and allow the life of Christ to live through you. So Mark 5 gives us four characters and circumstances that Jesus begins to display and prove that he's the Lord over. First of all, we looked at last week, verses one through 20. He deals with a demon-possessed man. Y'all remember? He couldn't be held. He was chained down. They had done all they could do. He's hollering and screaming. Y'all remember when I woke y'all up and some of y'all used the bathroom a little bit under your chair? Today, we're gonna look at a desperately pleading father. Next Sunday, we're gonna look at a destitute, polluted woman. And Today, tied with the desperately pleading father, we're gonna look at the dead prominent child and we'll look at that in three weeks from now. Do you understand that Jesus allows circumstances to come into your life to cause you to see how you need him? See, there's two types of people in this room today. Some that are too good to see their need. And then there's some in here that's too bad to see their need. So today, over the last few weeks, as we've seen the Lordship of Christ being revealed, we've seen it rejected. They said he had a demon. He taught them in parables. Then he gets into a boat, and in the midst of the storm, the disciples go, what man is this? And Jesus looks and says, do you still not have faith? They get on the other side, and there's a man start screaming running out of the cemetery, a place where no Jew has any business. He doesn't have any business in a cemetery, and he has no business around a demon-possessed individual. He has no business around swine. Jesus put those disciples in a boat, put them in a place that they had no business being in. Is anybody listening to me? So don't believe the lie that Jesus won't take you and put you in places that you ain't got no business. Is anybody listening to me? So let's talk about this lordship of Christ today, of what happened. So here's what happens. After they have the demons cast into the pigs and they run off, over 2,000 of them run off into the water, the people come and go, look, we can't, we can't handle you around here. You gotta go. So Jesus gets in the boat, goes back to Capernaum where we left four weeks ago. He gets back to Capernaum. When the boat gets to the dock on the other side, there's a multitude waiting on him. You got me? That's the setting. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 5. 
starting in verse 21, says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by a boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him. I love that. So Jesus went with him. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Vance Habner says this. There's a lot of people that are, that are throng him, but not many will touch him. There'll be many people going to a steeple today, and they'll sing songs, and they'll sing victory in Jesus, and they'll throng him, but not many will be like the woman with issue of blood, get through the crowd and touch him. So as we dive off into this, I got three important truths. Y'all ready to say amen? First of all, I want y'all to see the pleading to the master. See, the, the context of this passage is not Jairus, it's not his daughter, it's the Lord. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is about Jesus. Now, y'all remember last Sunday I shared with you the pleading of those people. Y'all remember? The demons begged, the demoniac begged, and the people begged. Same exact word that you're going to find in verse number 23. You find verse number 10. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, the demons are begging him. Y'all see that? Say amen. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Y'all got it? Also in verse 17, look at verse 17. It says, then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Look at verse number 18. And when he got into the boat, he, had, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be, be with him. So the demons begged him that they'd go into the, they pled with Jesus to go into the, the, to the pigs. The gathering demoniac begged him to let him go. And let me just say this. Once, once God puts his life into a man, you don't have to beg him. Did y'all hear me? But in America, see, we only have to deal with this Christianity on this side of the world. You go to anywhere else in the world where people are getting their heads chopped off or they're getting shot because they're getting together in the name of Christ, you don't have to beg people to show up because you got the, the real ones. You don't have the counterfeit. You don't have the convenience. You don't have the ones that's just hanging out the network and so they can be political and get in the choir so that they can go to the city council. It's quiet in here. We all right? So what's the pleading of the master? You got to see this. The moment the boat comes to a stop, there's a multitude there just like when the boat comes to the stop on the other side, there was a maniac there. Watch this. There's a ruler in the synagogue. Remember, we're dealing with the Gentiles last Sunday. Now we're dealing with the Jews. There's a ruler of the synagogue meets him and begins to plead and beg for Jesus to go with him. Let me give you a couple of things off of this. Y'all ready? Number one, I want you to see his reputation. See, when a man gets desperate enough, he don't care what his reputation is. Hey, when a man gets desperate enough, he'll get baptized even if he's scared of water. Now, baptism doesn't save you. But it's a profession of what Jesus is on the inside of you. When a man gets desperate enough, he doesn't care what his reputation is. The Bible says he's a ruler. Let me explain to you what that means, Greg Morris. That means Jairus was a man who was holy enough in the temple, in the synagogue, Opie, as he was making his way to Walmart, people would clear the way. Are y'all listening to me? Here's an individual, as he walked by, everybody got out of the way and they would bow down to him as a ruler. Here's this man desperate enough, are, are we listening? To come to Jesus. See, there's a lot of people that has way too much pride this morning in this room that will not come to Jesus because you're a great church member, but you're lost. You've been a deacon, you've been a Sunday school teacher, you've been on the mission field, you've been able to do all the things that you've ever been able to do, and Jesus has never given you his life. Biblical salvation is not you giving your life to Jesus. Biblical salvation is when Jesus gives his life to you. There's a major difference. So what is it? He's distinguished, is he not? See, some of y'all are starched this morning Y'all got, got it looking good? Jesus needs to knock the starch out of some of us in this room. 
You're distinguished. You come in. You know how to speak to people. Well, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. You know how to thumb your twiddling and twiddling your thumbs. Amen? We know how to stand up, sit down. We know how to amen. We know how to sing. We know how to do all the things. And we're so distinguished that we will not get desperate enough to get with Jesus. His position. What's his position? He's the ruler of the synagogue. I want you to hear me. This man, look at me. If you listen to me, wave. This man wouldn't ask anybody for help. This man would have all the answers. This man would know the first five books of the Bible. He would know the Pentateuch as a Jew. He would know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy verbatim, word by word, crossing the T's, dotting the I. This dude would have been the most holiest dude in Capernaum. Last week, we looked at a guy who had no hope because he was a Gentile and was demon-possessed. Today, we're looking at a man who has no hope, and he was very religious. Not only do we find his position as a distinguished man, I want you to understand he's a desperate man. None of his education, none of his money, none of, nothing, nothing could change his circumstance he's in. Are you listening? He's a desperate man. So what causes him to come to Jesus? Y'all ready? You ready? It's real simple. He's driven to Jesus because of the trial that's in his life. You go, Brother Brad, why, why do you want to deal with that? Because here's the deal. <laughs> this old boy knew who Jesus is. How do I know that? Because as you look at his familiarity, familiarity of Jesus, he's very familiar with Jesus. See, there's a lot of you in this room that's familiar with Jesus, but you don't know it. You know all the stories. You've even prayed a prayer. You've gone through the baptistry, but you don't know him. Go, Brother Brad, how do, how do you know that? Well, let's just look at it. Look at chapter 1. Matthew, um, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1. Look at verse 23 through 28. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 28. Look at what it says. Now, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, that's the demon speaking. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him, and then look, verse 27, then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. I want you to hear me. That's the synagogue he's the ruler over. So in Mark chapter one, this old boy Jairus comes in contact with a man who is inside of his synagogue who has an unclean spirit and Jesus casts him out. I told you last Sunday that I had a reason of believing that these demons wasn't the first time that they met Jesus. This ain't the first time Jairus has met Jesus either. He was familiar, not only in Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 28. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. It says, and he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there with a withered hand. Y'all remember this when we walked through this in that sermon? He had a withered hand. So they watched him closely. See, J. Iris was one of these that watched him closely to see if Jesus was going to do anything on the Sabbath. Y'all going to miss it. Listen, this old boy was a ruler. He's a distinguished man. He was familiar with Jesus. He had been in the church, around the church, been around all the things that Jesus has done, but he still didn't know who Jesus was. So he now has a trial in his life, and he's heard that this man that he's been watching intently in the synagogue over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee has cast out another unclean spirit, thrown him into pigs. He's also heard in Luke chapter 7. Luke records it in Luke 7 that 25 miles from where we're at in Capernaum, there was a widow whose son who lived in the city of Nan 
And as they're making their way to the cemetery, Jesus interrupts the funeral procession. Are you listening? Word has traveled. Because the Bible says that he became famous in all of that area, talking about Jesus. Are you listening? So as his familiarity with Jesus comes, in, Roman, in, in, in Luke 7, 1 through 5, there's a Roman centurion. There's a Gentile saying, my servant is dead. Just speak the words. I'm a man of authority. Y'all got to get it. I'm a man of authority. Just speak. You don't have to come to my house. That's a Gentile dude. If you'll just speak it, it'll happen. Then you move to, uh, down into verse 12 of Luke 7, and you find the widow's son is resurrected. Why am I bringing that out? Because the Roman centurion had enough of faith to say, Lord, you don't have to come, just speak the word. But yet a ruler of the synagogue says, would you please come to my house? If you'll just touch him like you did the casket, if you'll touch my little daughter, notice that's what he says, my little daughter is sick unto death, my little 12-year-old daughter is sick unto death. See, there's the compassion of a desperate man. See, until you get desperate, you won't change. Amen? Till you get desperate enough to be different and you surrender to allow the Spirit of God to do what only God can do, you'll keep coming and making all the commitments you're gonna make and you're gonna sit there today and you're gonna commit to God to read your Bible more, commit to God to come to church more, you're gonna commit God to be more kind and be all these other things. But until you see yourself the way Jesus sees you and you get desperate, you'll continue doing the same ridiculous stuff over and over and over again. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? So he was driven to the Lord by a trial. What you got going on in your life? Quit blaming Satan. It may very well be Jesus has caused a trial to come into your life to cause you to see who he is. He may have put you in a boat and got you in the middle of the Sea of Galilee knowing that the storm was coming. And then the storm didn't work, and so he had to put you on the other side where the pigs was so that the demoniac man would get your attention, and he still ain't got your attention. Got you back in a boat, took you back over to the synagogue. What else has he got to do? He was driven by a trial, but listen to me, he's drawn by trusting. Now watch this. He's not fully trusting Jesus for who Jesus is. He's only trusting Jesus that Jesus can fix his situation. He didn't come to Jesus because he's the Savior. He came to Jesus because of his situation. And there's a lot of you sitting in this room that you're banking your eternity on that you wanted God to fix your situation. And so you came to the church house and asked God and you begged and plead God and pled play, play with God and said, Lord, I promise you, if you'll get me out of this, if you won't let this come to light, I promise you I'll serve you. Just don't send me to Africa. He's driven by a trial to the Lord. He's drawn by trust because of what other people have said. He himself hadn't seen it, but yet he is drawn by trust. But let me tell you this, y'all ready? He's depending and dependent on the timing of Jesus. I told y'all two weeks ago, Jesus knew the storm was coming. And he still put him in the boat. He knew the demoniac was waiting on him, and he still went. What would have happened if Jesus just stayed on the other side? Today in Sunday school, if you come back tonight, for those of you that's at 8 o'clock Sunday school, you all have already covered this, but you're going to be covering John chapter 11 and the resurrection of Lazarus. You know what the Bible says that Jesus did? They called for him, and he waited for four days. See, you don't come to Jesus in your time and on your terms. You come to the Lord in his time and on his terms. So he comes... Here's what the Bible says, that as soon as the boat slid up, the multitudes are there. This old boy breaks through the multitude. Because hang on, next Sunday we're going to find a woman with an issue of blood breaking through the multitude. He doesn't care who sees him. Well, Brother Brad, I'm not going to come forward and kneel because, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I've got a great reputation. I'm telling you what, you're not desperate. But now let me help you. I said it last Sunday. I'm going to say it again this Sunday. If you get out of your seat and you come down here and you pray and whatever happens down here don't bring you back on Sunday night, it ain't of God. 
I've watched people run up and down the aisle, come and pray on Sunday mornings, and they won't come on Wednesday night, they won't come on Sunday night, they won't come any other time. I guess 35 minutes a week's good enough for them. That's not the Lord of the Bible. A demoniac man wants to follow Jesus. Can I get a witness in the house? Jesus will call storms and situations, Brother Kyle, to come into your life. Are you listening? So he can produce some brokenness in you. So he can produce some dependence upon you. See, in America, we don't want to be broken. Are we listening? We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be dependent. We got our declaration of independence. And that philosophy runs into our life and our religion. See, the truth of it is, some of y'all in here, that can't nobody tell y'all anything. You've been raised in church your whole life, and so therefore, point number two is your problem. Y'all ready? Not only was his reputation, he was desperate. I want you to hear about, about your religion. This old boy was a staunch Judaizer. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 3, you find that Jairus was a man who's trying to hook Jesus into hypocrisy and heresy. See, a Judaizer could not even interact, I want you to hear me, with anybody who had been in a cemetery, who had touched a dead body, who had touched anybody with an issue of blood, which is very important because stuck right here in the middle of it, a woman with an issue of blood. And he still goes to his house. Are you listening? So his religion, listen, he didn't care how distinguished he was. He was desperate, regardless of his reputation, he was willing to lay his religion aside and you go, you know what? I don't know what the rest of them boys at the synagogue know, but here's what I know about that dude right there. He's my only hope. I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you willing to make your eternity on whatever experience you've had? Because I'm gonna tell you what, people don't go to heaven because of an experience they had. People go to heaven because of who Jesus is. See, Judaism, listen to me. Opie, are you listening? His buddies, his cronies is the reason Jesus goes to the cross. Listen, not only did he have to leave his religion, he had to leave the synagogue. But this old boy's at a spot that he really don't care about any of those things anymore. He don't care what mom and daddy thinks. He doesn't care what his buddies at the church house thinks. He don't care about his buddies down there watching the barefooted chickers at the good time bar thing. Can I get an amen? They have made it their agenda to see that Jesus is taken out. This is the guy we're talking about. I want to ask you a question. What's the difference in this guy and a demoniac man? Nothing. What's the difference in a man sitting in a, in a church house and a man sitting in a jail house? Absolutely nothing. What's the difference in a preacher and a prostitute? Absolutely nothing. Are y'all listening to me? They all need the Lord. So it's religion. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. But let me tell you this. Not only does he not care about his religion, not only does he not care about his reputation, are you ready for this, Greg Morris? He don't care about his restrictions. I was preaching a youth revival, a small little church in Clanton, Alabama. When I got there, it was an associational youth, youth revival, youth rally, whatever. When I got there, there wasn't nobody with blue hair. They wouldn't even gray hair. They are blue hair. They tried to do something with it, and it went bad. You know what I'm talking about? Bunch of blue hair is there. There wasn't a, there wasn't a teenager. There wasn't a, small, there wasn't a young kid anywhere. So I'm sitting on the front road, and the preacher goes, Brother Brad, I'm sorry, man. We ain't got no teenagers here. We just got senior adults. I said, well, I'm going to preach. And I got up. 
and begin to preach on biblical salvation about Jesus giving his life to you, not you giving your life to Jesus. And before we got to the invitation, are you listening to me? Before we get, got through the whole deal that the musicians came, well, in the middle of my sermon, Brother Jaime, a senior adult woman got up out of the back of the, of the church, ran down front, come down to the altar, knelt down, looked at me, weeping and said, it's me, it's me, I'm the one that's lost. She didn't wait on the invitation. She didn't wait for the instructions and the restrictions so that it had to be a certain time that she could come forward and get it. She got desperate enough to lay it aside. I got down, shared the gospel with her. She prayed to receive Christ. Here's what she said. She said, Brother Brad, I've been a charter member of this church for 63 years. Everybody in this church, I've either changed their rear end or given them a cookie in vacation Bible school, and everybody here thought I was a godly woman, but way down deep inside, I knew there was something missing. And I want you to know, sitting on the back row in the middle of your sermon, the Spirit of God convicted my heart, told me it was me, and I couldn't do nothing. I didn't care about anybody else. I had to get to Jesus. That's how you finish well. What does it say he did? What does it say he did? He came to Jesus and he bowed down. Could you imagine? Let's just set the, let's set the platform. Y'all got it? Could you imagine? Here's the distinguished man in Capernaum in his own, own hometown. He's the ruler of the synagogue, Brother Jason. And all the multitudes there, everybody would have known who he was. And as he makes his way, the crowds begin to part. And he falls down at a man that two chapters ago called, he called a heretic. Could you imagine the impact of everybody in Capernaum seeing the, their preacher falling down at the feet of a man named Jesus? Brother Stoney preached an associational deal the other, about two weeks ago and three preachers got saved. I just, I just believe a preacher ought to be saved. I believe deacons ought to be saved. I believe Sunday school teachers ought to be saved. I believe everybody in the church ought to be saved. That's the reason we're in a mess because we got a lot of preachers preaching that ain't even saved. They can, they, we got great communicators but not many preachers. Well, Brother Brad, I don't need anybody to holler and shout and scream at me and I don't need anybody to preach to me. I need somebody to communicate. Well, go turn on CNN. They'll communicate a lot to you. You don't need information. You need revelation. You need transformation. So there's the pleading of the master. The same way the demons pled, the same way the people pled, he's pleading. Not only do you find the pleading of the master, and Jesus will cause storms to come into your life to cause you to be desperate. Don't you see the passion of the master? Watch what happens. You ready? Are you ready? And he went with him. And he went with him. I want to ask you a question. Don't you think Jesus knew that he needed to go? Don't you think that Jesus knew that the woman with an issue of blood that was about to touch the hem of his garment was there? So next Sunday when he turns around and goes, who touched me? He wasn't asking so that they could tell him who touched him. So Jesus went with him. And a great multitude followed him. And they thronged him. They waved their palm branches. They, oh my goodness. <laughs> but they didn't know him. See, there's a lot of people that are gather, but not many people are grabbing. Because there's not many people to get desperate enough to go, you know what, I don't care what my wife thinks, I don't care what my kids think, I don't care what my grandkids think, I got to go spend some time with Jesus. What's the passion? Well, first of all, he has the power over disease. Here's what I love about next Sunday is this woman got in the overflow of what somebody else had done. Jesus is on his way to, to do something else, and this woman got in the overflow. See, the truth of it is, Daddy, your family may get in the overflow of you getting right with God. If you'll quit being so distinguished and just simply get desperate. Not only does he have the power over disease, number two, don't you see his patience in the dilemma? Now watch this. Opie, if your daughter laid sick and Jesus stops to heal another woman, you're going to go, 
We ain't got time. See, some of y'all in this room think it's all about you. And it's really not about you. It's about the glory of the Lord. Don't you see the patience that he had? Jesus wasn't in a hurry. You know why Jesus wasn't in a hurry? Because he knew the outcome. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that when he got there, all them people that, listen, when I die, y'all, they, it's going to be like the Bible. Jill's going to have to hire people to come and mourn. She's got to come and pay, have to pay people. They didn't hire folks. All the weeping and wailing is going on. He gets there, has to put them out. Now watch. Not only is he patient in the midst of the crisis, was he not patient in the storm? He's asleep in the boat. See, you're all tied up and twisted. You got anxiety and you're having heart palpitations because you think Jesus don't know and he doesn't care. Let me tell you, he's not in a hurry. He's right on time. That's the reason you got to get desperate enough to be dependent upon his timing. Amen? Not only do you see that he has power over disease, he has patience in the dilemma. Listen to me. He has preeminence over death. I love what he says. He says the same thing about this girl as he says about Lazarus. Oh, they're dead, but they're just asleep. Do what? Oh, they're dead. How do I know they're dead? Because they, they're doing a funeral. But see, in God's eyes, it's not hopeless. In man's eyes, they've done all they can do. You remember when we were in the boat and the disciples said, Lord, don't you care we're perishing? That means they've done worked all night. They've done all they could do. They've raised the sails, lowered the sails. They throw the anchor. They've done everything they could do. And the boat they were in began to be broke up. And they go down and wake up. Jesus said, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus goes, don't you understand that you're not? And when he came in, he said to them, I love this. Why are y'all making this commotion and weeping? I wonder what Jesus would say if he walked in here physically today. I wonder what he'd say if he walked into some churches. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The hooting Annie hollering time? Y'all know what I'm talking about? All the lights and smoke. And what, what are y'all making all this commotion about? Well, we got to create the atmosphere. Let me just tell you, if you're attracted to the atmosphere and not the Almighty, I don't care what kind of atmosphere you have, you can live in a greenhouse and still die. Amen? Me and Jill, praise God, for the last three weeks have been landscaping. We went to a greenhouse, and there was some wilted in a greenhouse, and I'm going, how does that ha- happen? They're in a perfect environment, and they're getting watered, and they're wilted. Well, it got too hot for them. They don't like preaching. <laughs> Come on, Kyle, work with me. See, not only do you find the passion of the master because as he's moving, he's got power over diseases, and he's got patience in the dilemma, but he's got preeminence over death. Do you understand? He's the Lord. This is about the lordship of Christ. This isn't about a little girl dying. It's not about a woman with the issue of blood. Although in the practice of those two instances and circumstances and situation, Jesus will cause you to be desperate. Third thing, and I'm done. Not only do you find the passion of the master, not only do you find the pleading of the master, but you find the power of the master. Now I want you to watch this because as I've stood here and preached, this has happened in the minds of folks as I've looked at your face. See, here, here's the issue. The first thing I want you to see is the conflicting messages. Here's the conflicting messages. You got the chairman of some committee that says this, Brother Jaime. She's dead. Don't bother the Lord. Are, are y'all good? I'm going to give you three attitudes from three different characters in this part of the, of, of the text. You find this through 35 through 43. So let's look at it. The conflicting message is this. Verse 36, Jesus says, just believe. Amen? Just believe. The messenger comes back and says, don't bother. Are we good? Just believe, verse 36. It's a word of faith. Verse 35, the servant says, don't bother. That's a word of rejection. 
See, as the Spirit of God begins to put his finger on things in your life that contradict the Word of God, instead of you just believing, you go, I ain't going to bother with it today. I'll just wait. Don't bother. I, 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 listen, I appreciate y'all. I love you. Man, there ain't, another, there, ain't, there ain't a better church in America than the right here. I'm just telling you. I believe there is no place like this place anywhere near this place. This has got to be the place. I believe it. 22 years ago last week, I mean yesterday, amen, Miss Susan. <laughs> I think you're the only one left on the committee, me and you. <laughs> oh, Steve, that's right, Brother Steve. He had to help me get back to the rich land. Anyway, out of all the places in the world, he allows me to be a part of this church. And yet, I have folks say something like this. Now, Brother Brad, I don't want to bother you. Listen, you ain't bothering me. I'll tell you if I ain't got time. Now, Brother Brad, I know you're busy. How you know? You don't make my schedule out. I'm not too busy to handle whatever I need to handle, but let me just tell you this. If you've got a toenail that's ingrown and somebody's having something else going on, I'm going to go to the something else, with, you know, like a major deal. Don't get upset if, you can't, if I ain't going to pray for your toenail. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying in this house? We've got to love each other, amen? You've got to know that I'm going to break my neck to get to you. I'm going to do everything I can to get to you. But see, when you're in your crisis, you get so self-centered. But when you get desperate, you don't care. Amen? Here's what the servant says, Brother Jaime. Don't trouble the master anymore. He can't do anything. Some of y'all in this room have quit praying for the lost child that you have in your family. Some of y'all have quit praying for the lost spouse that you have because you don't think Jesus can do anything. You are the servant. Boy, there's a major difference in Jairus and his servant. Lord, if you can just come and touch my daughter, she can be healed. Don't bother him. Now, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna cover this, all right? So the conflicting messages are just believe, a word of faith, don't bother. So what's the takeaway from that? Verse 35 and 36, y'all ready? Don't trouble him, just trust him. Do you understand that everything in your life is no trouble to Jesus? He already knew it was coming. True of all. Now, I'm going to just tell you, trusting Jesus is easy to say and very difficult to do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in the house? I can stand up here and tell you you trust Jesus all day long. You say, man, I'm going to trust him. And you can tell me to trust Jesus because you're not in the circumstance. There's the conflicting message. There's the word of faith. But let me say this. There's a word of lost hope. This defeated messengers come and go, we've lost all hope. Y'all ready? You ready? It's too late. It's kind of like what you're going to do in John 11 today. Mary and Martha come and go, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You're too late. It's a defeated messenger. A word of lost hope. Here's the problem. Are you ready? Here's the truth. This messenger wanted Jesus to delay the death, not destroy it. You're going to miss it if you don't hear what I'm about to say. See, Jesus, if you'd have showed up before she died, you could have done something. See, some of you in this room only believe Jesus can work in your time and in your box. See, Jesus, if you'd have just come on 45 minutes earlier, here's Mary and Martha. Lord, if you'd have come when we sent for you, can I help you? Look at me. Everybody look up here. Probably the reason you had not seen Jesus move yet is because you're not desperate enough. Hebrews 2.14. Here's what the writer to the Jews said. Remember, this old boy's a Jew, right? Ruler of the synagogue. Here's what the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 2.14. 
Inasmuch then talking about Jesus, as the children have partaken in their flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. They've already told him that he was demon possessed. Why would Jesus resurrect the one who had the power of death? So he's showing his lordship. Y'all think Satan has got it? No, 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 no. I'm the Lord over life. I'm the Lord over death. So here's the deal. Old girl had to die so Jesus could prove who he is. Y'all ready for this? And so do you. Hebrews 9, 27 says, it's appointed a man who wants to die and after that comes the judgment. See, at that judgment, you're not gonna stand and give your defense. That judgment's gonna come and he's gonna show you who he is. Amen? So you're gonna die so Jesus can prove who he is. If you die without him, he's gonna prove that he's your Lord as you spend eternity in hell. If he's your Lord when you die, he's gonna prove that he's your Lord as you rejoice and enjoy him throughout all of eternity in heaven. So, I wanna ask you a question. How many of y'all in this room just want Jesus to delay it for just a few moments instead of allowing him to handle it? See, the conflicting message is the word of lost hope. But Jairus is a, not a defeated messenger. He's a desperate man. He's a desperate, determined man, so he's got a word of longing hope. I want you to look at verse 35. Let's pick up in verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word, that, the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now I'm gonna stop right there for just a minute because I want you to look at this man, Jairus, of what he says. Look at verse 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, verse 23, and he begged him earnestly. Y'all ready? Y'all remember last week I gave you the Verb tense, move voice and tense of the verb begged and pleaded. Here's the indicative tense. Let me tell you what it means. Y'all ready? It's in the imperfect tense. It means that J. Iris continued to beg, plead, and beg, plead, beg, and plead. Lord, I know you can do it. Lord, I know you do it. Don't listen to that servant. I know you can do it. Just come to the house. Lord, I know you can do it. Don't, don't bother him anymore. Quit asking. It means that he continuously, repetitively asked the Lord. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When's the last time you prayed for something for six months? Or when did you pray one time and because Jesus didn't do what you thought he needed to do, you quit praying? Are you desperate? Are you desperate? But are you gonna let your distinguishing reputation keep you from your desperation of coming to the one who's the only one who has hope. So here's a longing hope. He's desperate, but he's determined, Brother Kyle. He breaks through the crowd. Just like next Sunday, this woman with the issue of blood, she's determined. Are you willing to do whatever you need to do to get to wherever you need to get to to get to Jesus? Or does it gotta be convenient? Does it gotta last within, does, does it gotta happen within the hour you show up? The storm caught the, the disciples by surprise. The demon-possessed man caught the disciples by surprise. Jairus caught the disciples by surprise. The death of the child caught them by surprise. But I'm telling you, none of it catch Jesus by surprise. And wherever you're sitting today, none of it's caught Jesus by surprise. But are you desperate enough to keep hanging on? Amen? Not only do you have a word of longing hope and the word of lost hope, don't you see the word of living hope? And that's the delivering master. 
Not a defeated messenger, not a desperate, determined man, but a delivering master. Y'all gotta see it. Here it is. Jesus goes and very gently says, Arise. Defeats and delivers the death. Next Sunday, the woman with an issue of blood, he defeated and delivered from the circumstance. But I want you to hear me. Jesus didn't come to change your circumstance. He come to change you in your circumstance because Paul was chained to a wall at midnight had unbelievable circumstances and situation and sang, and a Philippian jailer in his whole house got saved. See, your circumstance don't determine whether or not you sing. Your circumstance don't determine whether or not you come and worship. Your circumstance is a way for God to see how desperate you really are to grab a hold of him. You go, brother, I'm pretty desperate. No, the, listen, there could be one cloud in the sky and you think it's gonna rain and to keep you from church. Some of y'all already think y'all gonna be sick tonight and y'all ain't gonna come back. We went through the COVID. If y'all, if you're listening to me, wait. We went through the COVID. We go, well, we're not gonna go to church. We can't risk it. Those same people went to Walmart. Don't even get me on the word essential. Because I'm telling you right now, the word essential don't even work in the kingdom of God. He's only. Essential means that I've got to dictate which one I'm going to be willing to go with. But the God who spoke this world into existence, that a man tells me he give him his life on the inside of him. I can't find him with a pack of bloodhounds. But tells me he's saved. Cusses like a sailor. Never shows up on church. Never. 12 times a year, he thinks he's faithful. Show up for fellowship on Sunday night, but ain't been here in a month of Sundays the rest of the time. You just let the cat out of the bag. So we gotta feed you some ribs before you come to church. We gotta have a catfish plate. Well, they don't sing my songs. It ain't about you. Brother Brad, are you mad? No, I'm just telling you, it's urgent. Just watch the news. You see what they're doing with Israel? Read Ezekiel 36, 37, 38 today when you go home. The whole stinking world's turning against them. It's going exactly how God said it was gonna happen. It may very well be that we're the last generation. And I say, come even now, Lord Jesus. I want you to look at what they do, Brother Kyle, when they get there. The Bible says that they begin to mock him. They begin to ridicule him. They begin to laugh. When Jesus says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Here's what it says. They continually mocked him, just like Jairus continually to beg, begged him. These are the people that got hired. You say, Brother Brad, how do you know that the people got hired? Because the Bible says he didn't let nobody follow him. But Peter, James, and John, and Jairus, and his wife, they go into the house. Are we good? See, some of y'all are ambulance chasers. You really don't care about who's in the ambulance. You just want to go see where they're going. Are we good? Let me, let me give you an example. There's a lot of people don't really care what goes on in this building, but we opened a new building. Everybody showed up to see what was on looked like on the inside. We'd have an open house. Now, they ain't going to give a dime for it, and they're not going to come and do, they, they want to see what it looks like. Those are not followers. Those are people that just attach themselves. Are y'all listening? I want you to hear me right here. I'm done. I'm, I got two points and I'm done. It's going to be real quick. You ready? Here it is. Those people are parasitic. They suck the life out of people that do have life. And they live off the life of somebody else. 
they continue to scorn. That's in the imperfect indicative tense. They just keep, they just kept on. Brother Brad, why are you gonna do a school? You think you're really gonna matter? Yeah, to the 70 that's gonna show up next, next year we are. Well, y'all ever gonna run a thousand? I don't care, I'm gonna, we're gonna get whoever God brings. See, our goal is not numbers. Our goal is to change the culture and the environment of people and how they think and think in this county. How they think in this church. How they think in their home. What you see is commanding mandate. <clears throat> the conflicting message, the continuing mocking, but don't you see the commanding mandate. Y'all ready? Here it is. First of all, I want you to see what he, how he admonished the dead. You do understand that this woman or this girl couldn't say anything. Jesus walked up to her, grabbed her by the hand, and said, Arise. Why is it important? Because here's the deal. If Jesus has never breathed his breath inside of you this morning, you're dead. And unless God comes and kneels down next to you and grabs you by the hand, you're going to remain dead. A.W. Tozer says, that Christianity should be a life that's represented by a tree that's an evergreen tree that's always living, not a Christmas tree that has ornaments on it. Some fake thing we've got up, hang it up, and we come in seasons. Well, it's hay season, Brother Brad. You know, I've got to cut the hay. Come on, work with me. Well, it's ball season. You know, we got no. Just tell it to Jesus and see what he says about it. And if you think Jesus go cut hay and skip church, you're sadly mistaken. So what do he do? He tells all these people that's in the house, that's getting paid to come in the house, he told them to leave, exactly the same word that, they, that the people on the other side told Jesus to leave. Now, Lord, we don't need your presence. It's pretty cool that you throw them demons in them pigs, but we rock the pigs more than we do the people. We like our occupation. You're going to kill all these pig herders because these pigs are used for the sacrifice of that goddess up there on the mountain that we're going to be worshiping. So we need our sacrificial pigs more than we need you in our, on our place. In other words, we'd rather be Baptist than biblical. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? He told them to leave. But not only do you find the admonition to the dead you ready for this, Brother Kyle? It's real simple, Wesley. You find the appetite of the living. Brother Greg, when old girl was dead, she didn't have an appetite. So a man that never desires to come, a man that doesn't have an appetite to read his Bible, a man that doesn't have an appetite to share the gospel, a man that doesn't have an appetite to tithe. A man that doesn't have an appetite to serve and sing in the choir and come to Sunday school. A man that doesn't have an appetite for the things of God. They're not carnal, they're lost. They're dead. You go, Brother Brett, that's a pretty bold statement. You think you're the only one saved. I can't speak for you, I can only speak for myself. And I'm telling you, in 1986, August the 21st, are you listening to me? The Lord Jesus knelt down next to my dead spiritual body. At 13 years of age, I knew how to cross the T's, dot the I's. I was teaching a senior adult Sunday school man's class at 13 years of age. I could quote the Bible. I could give you all the stuff that you needed to hear. And God showed me me. And I got desperate enough to know that God doesn't have grandchildren. And he said, Talitha Kumi. Arise. Brother Mike, two rows from the back. Stan got up and preached. I was like, shut up. I got to tell you what happened. Got ready for just as I am, all 19 verses of it, because that's the invitation hymn that you sing at a Baptist church. I had to slide out, come down front, and tell everybody that thought I had it all together. I had to put my reputation aside, Brother Greg. I put my religion aside because God made me desperate enough to know, you know what? You ain't going to make it. The only hope you've got is Jesus. Jesus. 
give them something to eat. Amen? Anything alive is always going to feed on the words and the works of the Lord. Now, what I just said stung. And what I said made some of y'all mad. But that's okay. Because I'd rather you get mad at me and stand before Jesus and let him remind you of what I just told you than for me to not tell you. You got the pleading to the master. Amen? You've got the power of the master. And Jesus says, get up, feed her. Because Matthew 4, 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, he quotes the Old Testament. Here's what he said. Man can't live on bread alone. You can't live off what you provide. You can only live off the word. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Oh, you can physically pile it high and deep. That's what a PhD is. Amen. Some of y'all got PhDs. It means pilot high and deep or post hole digger. Anyway, I got a whole lot of them things. Man, what a sad day it is that we live in, that we pilot high and deep, and we think we just come and live and eat, drink, be merry, and we die. Man, what to God would live for the next generation? What to God that people 100 years from now that don't even know the people sitting in this room by name are you, are you listening to me? Greg, are you listening to me? I believe every word in the word of God is there by the spirit of God. I believe it's infallible. It's in, inerrant. There's nothing there by mistake. Are you ready? Here's what Mark says. There's a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And you and I, 2,000 years later, open the word of God and we find a man who was desperate enough to get down on his face in the midst of his trials, in the midst of his circumstances, in the midst of his situations, in the midst of the storms of life, he turned and saw the only one who was his help. He laid aside his religion. What did God 100 years from now? They'd look on May the 23rd, 2021, and they'd look in the history books of a New Prospect Baptist Church and go, whatever your name is, got desperate enough to come on a Sunday morning. Kyle by name. Brad by name. Opie by name. Lee McDougal by name. Here it is. Can you embrace the thorn? If you're not uncomfortable, That's a dangerous place to be. The mama eagle puts briars in the nest so the baby eagle learns how to fly. As long as the nest is comfortable, the birds will allow the mamas to keep feeding them. Your trial may very well be taking you to the next level. But are you going to be desperate enough to recognize it? There's some of you in this room that you're lost. You know you're lost. You've been fighting it. You've been, you've been telling yourself, you've been lying to yourself that you're okay. Is that right, Richie? Brother Richie came last week on Wednesday night, wasn't it, brother? I can't remember if it was Wednesday night or Sunday night. Walked right up here and he's what he said. He said, Brother Brad, I've been fighting it for quite some time. I'm tired of fighting it. I'm lost. Steve Carter got in on that, didn't you, bro? See, guys, here's where we are. It's 1101, and the message is urgent because we really don't know how long the church is going to stay here because as I watch the news, I believe there's an archangel licking his lips about to put it to the mouthpiece of a trumpet and we're going to be gone. But Brad, I don't believe that. That's fine. 
But you better believe this. There's a living hope, and his name is Jesus. You can long, and you can have lost hope. But until you come to the living hope, you'll stay in a boat that you think Jesus is asleep in. And you'll stay in a graveyard where nobody can control you. Or you can get desperate enough to break through the crowd and lay it aside and say, Lord, please, would you just come to the house? Let's pray.